We'll start. Uh, so on behalf of the Director General, Mr. Sadhyasachi Mukherjee, and the uh, members of the Museum Society, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Mirjam, but it's Mariam, okay? I'll do it the Iranian way, okay? Iran, Mariam Grusius to the CSMBS this evening. Um, it's a very interesting talk, and uh, I think those of you who were present here a few months ago when uh, Professor Kavita Singh gave her lecture, she only took four objects which were in, on display several decades ago. They went for exhibitions from here to the UK, and we thought that some of them were lost, uh, some had been lost and subsequently, through her research, discovered they had been actually destroyed because of lack of space, simply because they were there for an exhibition. And once the exhibition, and they were reproductions, but very good reproductions, but they are no longer there for us to see. And she ended her lecture by a very f lovely success story that one of the pieces, one of the four pieces under discussion actually came back to India and was installed in its uh, original setting. And uh, that's the way we hope that is the way forward. Although I don't think India is going to get back too many gifts from museums, as long as they're up for display and not lying in storage somewhere because that is uh, fatal for the object. And also, I think it gives us a lo great loss in placing that object in the historical context. So we are indeed very grateful that you accepted our invitation. She's incredible. This lady is traveling with a five-month-old baby and a five-year-old son. This is the new world of museum curators, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, no more, uh, sorry, I've just had a baby, I can't do the lecture, I haven't finished my article. I don't know how many times we must have heard that, Dr. Doshi. But um, thank you so much. Despite everything, you've been very professional in addressing this issue for us, and we're looking forward to your lecture. I'm not going to talk about the lecture, it'll speak for itself, but uh, in the course of conversation, she has a huge bio data and the one that I told her you should have put it in, especially for India. Uh, she spent a whole year as a Mahindra scholar under the stewardship of Dr. Homi Bhabha at Harvard. And the way she described that year is a dream come true for every young person. She could practically do whatever she wanted and she managed to do a lot of research in that one year while she was at Harvard. But other than that, she is a research fellow in colonial and global history at the German Historical Institute in London. She holds degrees in history of art and cultural studies, a master's from Humboldt University in Berlin, and history and philosophy of science, PhD, from the University of Cambridge. And she's also studied at Oxford, which she hadn't put down in her formal biodata, but it's there on the site. Her current interests concern the history of archaeology, the history of heritage, the history of photography, and the tensions between preservation and destruction in the Middle East and Europe. She recently co-edited with Kavita Singh, Museum Storage and Meaning, Tales from the Crypt. It was a Rutledge publication, extremely scholarly, produced in 2018. Her lecture is sponsored by her institute India Visiting Fellowship Program, and we are delighted that this evening's lecture, that we have got the support of our life member of the Museum Society, Mr. Modit Jain. Thank you very much for once again, not only sponsoring the lecture, but taking your time off your busy schedule to be here with us. We have a small memento for you, Mariam, and I would request uh, Dr. Saryu Doshi She's the editor of the academic journal of the, Prince of, of the CSMVS Museum, 
And this is on behalf of all of us, a big thank you. Thank you. And before I hand over the podium to Mariam, uh, please mobiles off. And tomorrow we have a very different lecture here by Dr. Purnima Sri Krishna, Rare Narrative Panels of the River Ganga and Naraka at the Nila Kanteshwara Temple, 6 p.m. here tomorrow evening. We look forward to seeing you, all of you here again. So thank you, Mariam. We're looking forward to your lecture. Dusty boxes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for coming here tonight uh, to my talk. I would um, very warmly like to thank Dr. Ferosa, as well as the sponsor and the Museum uh, Society for inviting me to give this lecture tonight. It's a real honor to speak um, here next to such a, an, an incredible collection and also to speak in, in Mumbai. Um, I should also say it is possible to travel with small children because the welcome has been incredibly warm and supportive. So it also d it always depends on where you actually travel to. People are treating you. Um, and so this is what really makes a, a big difference. So thank you very much for that as well. So in 2013, um, the city of Detroit declared its uh, bankruptcy. And searching for solutions how the city's economic declines could be suspended, decision makers noted that actually one of its most valuable assets to pay off city debts was the art collection at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And as one can imagine, the public opinion was divided. And this concerned in particular the question uh, which objects the museum could get rid of. So one visitor, uh, cited by NPR News, suggested I wish I could copy an American accent, but I can't, um, so just imagine it. I think you have to do what you have to do, and that might be to sell a couple of pieces of art, not necessarily the ones that you have that are meant to draw people in. Those are sacred. You keep those. But I mean, they all have stuff lying around in their basement that they only bring out periodically. Dump those. So what this visitor meant was art and storage, that is, the objects locked and shelved away in boxes, some of them indeed dusty, that nobody ever gets to see on museum display. The visitor, in a way, also hit the nail on the head. As many of you know, a majority, often more than 90% of museum collections are indeed in storage, and some of it, as the visitor calls, uh, lying around in basements or attic rooms, and some of it, as the visitor also suggests, not actually to be missed in a mu uh, in, uh, if, uh, if they were dumped. And the Detroit incident opened up important and even moral questions in museum studies uh, that I will follow uh, out through this lecture. Why is deaccessioning a dirty word? What is so problematic about deaccessioning objects? If money is needed and museums run out of storage space anyway. And there are also other implications in this comment that might give us some thoughts. Are objects in storage less valuable than those on display that this visitor even describes as sacred? What is so wrong also with some objects being on displays and other on, in storage? Or in other words, why should museums be about display? And who has made this claim in the first place? So in spite of recent curatorial attempts to exhibit so-called visible storage areas, prevailing debates in the history of museums and collectings are, as we all know, mainly centered around these questions of exhibiting, of display, and also spectatorship. But this history of display uh, tells mainly very triumphalist stories about the structure, the purposeful, the strategic gathering of things according to a system, the features of which are clearly defined. But this kind of discourse has distorted also the museums in many ways. For example, it ignores the fact that museums 
as many of you who actually work at a museum know, do not just consist, consist of exhibition halls, but actually of vast hidden spaces. So it has also left millions of objects out of our museum histories. And lastly, it presented the museum as an organized and a stable space in which only museological results are visible, not actually the intermediate stage of their coming into being. And as a result, not only a vast physical, but also important uh, semantic aspect of museums and their collections have been eliminated from discussions in museum history. So the binary between display and backstage of museums has previously evoked the assumption that the exhibition area functioned as a kind of theater um, where objects perform on stage. Um, while in the back they are processed from their existence as a mere thing to a proper artifact. But, as I would like to argue, there is more uh, to say about museum storage. And the following presentation is an attempt to open up some topics for discussion. Of course, I would love to hear your own stories, if there's time after the lecture, which I hope there will be. So thinking about this threshold between storage and display, provokes not only questions about the mysterious backstage of museums, but also entirely new questions about canonization, the politics of collecting, the ethics of preservation, and the economies of storage and display. So categories that may and will be discussed also very differently in different parts of the world, why it's so important also for me personally to speak here in India and not just present this kind of research in Europe and the United States. So a while ago, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Kavita Singh, who many of you um, have met, and I, we organized a workshop to explore issues of museum storage from a cross-cultural perspective with participants from Europe and India. And this workshop took place in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, but we previously met uh, in Delhi. And out of this event uh, grew a, a publication project um, I, I put some flyers uh, on a table um, next, uh, next to the door, to the exit door, so feel free to bring that to see the table of content. Um, there is, a, there is a, a, I think, a discount code. Um, it's still a very expensive book. Um, unfortunately, we hope that there might be a paperback at one point, but also don't tell anyone that I actually told you that, but there, a large amount is actually already on Google Books, so feel free to um, have a glimpse. So um, I bring you today, um, in case you don't have time to read the book, um, our thoughts enriched by the work I would like to acknowledge of many others who joined us in this exploration, as well as some case studies uh, from my own research on museums in Britain and in Germany. I will explore uh, this issue through two themes. The uh, subtopic, um, first, the spaces of storage, and second, through objects in storage, or in other words, the unshown, the unshowable, the no longer shown objects. So I'll first talk about the spaces of storage. The museum store is a place. And just as there is a history of museum architecture that dramatizes the museum's role as a secular temple or palace of the people, um, there must also be a history of the architecture of the museum store. The 18th century French architect Bouyer envisioned vast buildings for libraries, archives, and museums. And this infinitively receding racks, the shelves, and the niches, they were designed to actually hold an infinity of knowledge in imagined classical halls. In practice, however, museum storage actually seldom displays the architectural flourish of museum exhibition spaces. So in these crowded shelves and battle frame racks, the windowless corridors of the museum store that many of you know, can we actually discern a history or even a poetics of museum storage architecture? Science historian James Del Borgo reminds us that the museum was not always divided into distinct zones for gallery and for storage. So James Delborger explored uh, Sir Hans Sloane's collection that formed the kernel of the British Museum. 
In the late 18th century, this collection was a kind of store into which visitors were admitted, so extensive cabinet drawers in Sloane's home um, housed these, uh, the specimens that he had collected in the West Indies, and they were also annotated by notes in Sloane's hand. And the visitors to this house were actually allowed to open the drawers um, and to handle the objects, um, always with the awareness of Sloane's own presence as the collection's uh, progenitor. And the small audience of gentlemen scholars, probably similar in class or education to the collector, and these social relations were manifest in the nature of this museum space and their interaction with it. So these scholars were allowed to handle, but also to touch and to smell, and even taste the samples in the drawers. Later, making things public also meant making them untouchable. And this move resulted in a loss of this smell, this taste, and this touch um, when handling objects. So as audiences changed in the museum, and the museum shifted uh, the nature also of its pedagogic uh, address, large parts of the collection that were available for consultation became simply unshowable to the new audience. Masterworks or specially imported objects were then separated from the study collection and only the former were placed on selective display. Today, however, we see a new trend in museum display, particularly in science museums, in which scientists are often made visible as they work in labs or among collections. But also conservators, like uh, for example in the new Harvard Art Museum that um, was about to be reopened while I was at the Mahindra Humanity Center, um, there a large part of Renzo Piano's edition is in fact used for the display of labor but also neatly arranged substances for conservation. So while the viewers who are admitted into the museum cannot always enter these labs and handle specimens, they at least see other specialists doing so. And they also see the ways in which specialists can engage with the specimens or the art. At a remove, uh, this is a kind of return to an earlier uh, mode, I think, of engaging with museum collections. But one rule, of course, still applies. Uh, do not touch, and also do not knock. <laughs> so <laughs> that knocking, and therefore uh, not even touching the protecting glass was not allowed, was observed by my colleague Nikki Reeves, who is a curator of the Hunterian uh, Museum in Glasgow. Here he is seen in action, in storage, of course. So uh, we asked Nikki um, about the new interest in making storage visible, so this kind of staging the backstage that is now so popular in museums. And Nikki uh, traced the history of visible storage of the past 40 years, and so he historicized this seemingly new curatorial concept. But often this is actually down to showing the packing cases. And so Nikki Reeves provocatively asked, what prompts these attempts to make visible storage? Is this a project of making as much as possible accessible and being seen also to do so? Kind of following a democratic logic where nobody excluded from any part of the museum? Or is this more related to showing off or even hoarding? How does the creation of visible storage areas relate also to the digital ambitions of museums today? Does making things from storage um, visible demystify things, or does it actually mystify objects even further? So here uh, at the Vene, it is not actually clear whether the cleanest trolley is part of the installation or not especially if you think of this artwork by Fred Wilson in the Ian Potter Museum in Melbourne. 
In any case, the rhetoric of revelation where public actually wants to be taken on tours in formerly backstage areas puts a burden on curatorial staff. And let me just add, um, Nicky Reeves now has a block where he, uh, every time he comes to London from Glasgow, he takes a picture of this gallery and he traces the movement of the trolley in, in, the store, in this area, uh, as well as the letters. The blog, I think, is called Trolleys in Letters. You should definitely check it out. And so he's, he's as a curator, he's interested in, in these kind of movements where practices are made visible through uh, equipment. So, sorry, I stopped um, about the burden being taken um, on, on curatorial staff with this kind of movement. So during our workshop, we also wanted to give uh, participants a possibility to see and access storage as, uh, areas. Um, but the curators um, in this audience here will know that there's actually a lot of self-policing going on uh, while taking audiences backstage. So what is remarkable is that many are, quite understandably so, reluctant uh, to, sh to share details of messy storage areas uh, even amongst colleagues and in academic workshops, or maybe especially uh, amongst colleagues. I, I wouldn't be able to say because I'm not a curator right now. So um, we, we ask them questions like, do you have boxes containing items without labels, or are there spaces in your collection of which you don't have the slightest idea uh, what they might contain? Or do you ever deaccession objects? Um, and of course, always the answer was always no, no, no. Of course, we don't do that. No, we don't have that. And so, um, we couldn't prompt anyone to give a different uh, answer. Um, in short, uh, while visible storage appears to be backstage, I think it actually is yet another front stage. And as we saw, some kind of behind the scenes operations are made visible, the workings of scientists and curators, for instance, but some kinds of workings are not at all made visible. So we are unlikely to be given access to the backstage habitus of the museum janitors or the museum directors. Many museum stores, uh, such as the Nassammlung at the Berlin Natural History Museum, are purpose-built, uh, so they're constructed for certain collections, but others are also provisional, so annexing available facilities as the collection grows. But what happens uh, when the space occupied by a store actually becomes valuable real estate, so too valuable to continue being used as a back room? So with the pressure of real estate uh, rising, museum stores move into less desirable parts of town. And then as those uh, prices rise as well, it may move to remote uh, locations. And our host institution for the workshop, uh, as I said, was the v &A, And for its deep storage facility, it actually uses an, ab an abandoned mine in, in Wiltshire, which is the county. Um, not exactly around the corner uh, from London, so maybe two to three hours away. The Science Museum in London also has uh, taken an aircraft hunger in Roughton, again, not around the corner. And other institutions have taken over nuclear bunkers and for museum storage. So here we see a an interesting relationship between outmoded industry or obsolete um, military infrastructure and museum storage. So should we see this as a process in which a regime of things like industry or an arsenal that lose value through age, um, while things like museum objects gain value as they age, or shall we see this as a soft culture filling this post-industrial void left by a retreating hard economy? Here I gave you a map so you see where some of these um, storage areas actually are. So when these things move out of the VA and uh, VNA and they are shipped off to Wiltshire uh, to be packed and then taken by cranes down the tunnels of an abandoned mine on the countryside, uh, the object has actually gone from storage to deep storage. So do these things ever leave deep storage once they enter it? Certainly, uh, the remote location where the entire area is a secure location with no public access 
uh, the physical difficulty and also the expense of moving them, the elaborate packing um, necessary for their storage suggests that once these things go underground in this way, it is actually unlikely that they will ever emerge into light again. So one assumes that museums choose to send certain objects into deep storage because it is not anticipated that they will need to be seen in the foreseeable future. But the museum is still obliged to preserve them. So the phenomenon of deep storage seems paradoxical. The museum invests in the entire facility in archival quality conditions, in keeping and maintaining and safeguarding thousands of objects where the conditions of maintaining and keeping them make them actually impossible to use or to see. And finally, what about those museums that are not able to extend their storage into off-site facilities and can't afford to or don't have the space to keep their reserves stored on-site? So are all museums committed to the preservation of all objects for all times? And have museums begun to, or would they like to deaccession objects or distribute them to other institutions to reduce backroom expenses? And have museums even come to the point of destroying objects because the costs of storing them are simply too high? Or will they remain committed to storing their objects forever? You can tell that I'm asking more questions than <laughs> giving answers, but that's why I called the lecture Thoughts of Museum Storage. Maybe you can help me find some answers. So uh, the book is also supposed to be a provocation. So in 2015, uh, the New York Times even detected trends among European museums to deaccession parts of their stored collections to pay for new acquisitions. In order, to, uh, in order to either buy objects of greater importance, or at least what they considered greater importance at that very moment, or uh, to meet other financial obligations, as government uh, cultural subsidies have been cut back, especially in the UK. So deaccessioning, um, a polite word in the art world for such sales, entails the permanent removal of an object from a museum collection. <coughs> Uh, Deaccessioning was once seen a moral taboo, which is unsurprising since the mechanisms can, uh, it can trigger are most likely to be very complex because it strikes the very heart of what is deemed meaningful and valuable in our material culture. But what is of lesser or greater importance? What can and should be sold? And also who decides? These questions have been a big issue in Detroit, as I explained in, in, at the beginning. So as we think about uh, the commitment to great expense, uh, the necessary infrastructure, and the stability needed to commit to being a, a museum, a large museum for the long durée, uh, one realizes that a certain kind of museum professionalization and also certain kinds of museum standards could only be thought of in very wealthy contexts. It would take a certain kind of society and also a certain kind of historical or economic circumstance to develop the kind of archiving impulse that we see in Britain or Germany, for instance. So Kavita and I, of course, we also wanted to explore what is, is it like in India, where despite the huge number of cultural artifacts that seem almost to bubble up the soil, of the soil, and museum culture is not very highly developed in the, in the sense that little money is available to support either museums and archaeology, even if the will is there. So what kind of approaches and strategies are improvised in conditions of lack? And we had some very interesting uh, case studies here. So Apinder Singh uh, showed us an archaeological site in Kumbraha near Patna where a building from the second century BC was discovered. And this was an 80-pillared uh, hall. And today at the site, uh, one sees some stumps. But the larger pillars that were excavated were simply too big for the locally available resources to handle. There was no equipment to carry it with also, and also nowhere to carry these pillars to. So, the archaeologists who discovered the pillars, they photographed them, they noted the inscriptions, and then they buried them back in the soil. 
So the ground was uh, considered a safe storage place. And odd as it seems at first, this practice that appears aberrant can also help us look critically at what is normal. So why is it that every object that is dug out of the soil must enter the museal regime? Why must it be kept open and accessible in a facility built for it? And one must also ask how very different this kind of burial is from storing objects in a mine in Wiltshire. So there is a procedural gap between the burial in the ground and the burial in the mine, but effectively are the situations not actually very similar to each other. And likewise, we may also ask if objects are not actually safer underground. So what was never excavated in the 19th century by European archaeologists in Mesopotamia, so in today's Iraq, for example, cannot actually be destroyed by ISIS. Um, I was told by experts, uh, by Assyriological experts, that most of artifacts, most of art the artifacts are actually still underground and a dozens of um, winged bulls and lions are actually still in layers um, underneath the ones that were destroyed. So the line between destruction and preservation is very thin, and so there's a very complex argument um, going on. Another example from India uh, that was presented by my co-editor Kavita Singh examined the relationship between a historical site, a museum, and museum storage. So it's a situation that could only occur in a place where religion and religious uh, revivalism are an important part of public life. So Somnath in Western India was the site of a famous Hindu temple, and from um, the 10th century onwards, the temple was repeatedly destroyed by Islamic em emperors and rebuilt by Hindu kings. And after a final destruction, it fell out of use some 600 years ago. But this desecrated uh, temple became the emblem of Hindu uh, subjugation at Muslim hands. And just months after British rule ended in 1947, Hindu leaders felt India was now finally their own and urged followers to build a new temple at the site. But the site for the temple was not empty ground. So there was a substantial structure dating back to the 12th century and the crowds of pilgrims who converged on the site, dismantled it by hand to make room for the new temple that would be built. But then what was to be done with the stones from the old temple? <coughs> make a museum for it, of course. So calling this place a museum legitimates the, fa the act of vandalism as an act of care. And with no efforts um, at display or didactic texts, the museum is effectively um, something like a store, Kavita argued, that clears away inconvenient historical residues to free up the land for, for new life. So I now would like to move to a cluster of themes not about the spaces of storage, but the objects that are stored in them. The objects that live out uh, their lives in museum storehouses are either the unshown, the unshowable, or the no longer shown objects. Um, in the, this is the second part of my lecture. In our book, we also wanted to examine these categories and understand how an object could actually slip between them. Now, museum collections are a bit like an uh, archive simultaneously the outcome of a historical process and also the very condition for the production of historical knowledge. But what is it uh, that informs the decision to show certain things and also to keep others in reserve? So how is the canon formed? Is it aesthetics, ideology, or some sometimes purely pragmatic reasons? The expanded display space at the New Whitney Museum of American Art in New York has, for example, now made room to show American art that had earlier been in the store. So canons, uh, they shift over time, and the taste, tastes also fluctuate. But how about objects that were once displayable but now have lost their displayability? So do these objects lose historical value? 
what happens to the economic value of equivalent things. So Kavita again gave us an example of a display object that had become undisplayable. Uh, this grand stone carved gateway was produced in Gwalior in the 1880s as an example of local stone carving skills. It was then shipped to London for the Colonial and Indian Exhibition of 1886, where it was a celebrated exhibit, and it was sent on to the v in, in London as a gift. As the v a uh, was Britain's Museum of Industrial Art, this example of art industry in a British colony had found its appropriate home, and it was installed in the gallery um, earmarked for Indian art. But the museum decided to use this gallery to show their collection of Raphael, cut, uh, Raphael cartoons. So the highly ornamental oriental gateway was too visually uh, discordant to be part of this architecture, this new architecture, and also too large to put anywhere else. It actually remains in the gallery, but it is hidden from view behind the wooden fas fascia that we see here. So the gateway was once a valued exhibit, but it disappeared when the museum's taste and also the priority changed. But there are also objects, many objects, that will never be shown during their museological lives. So things that are or were acquired by museums, even as it is known or expected that they will never be put on display. So what kind of things are these and how is the act of their collection rationalized and justified? Are such things accidental acquisitions such as archeological finds or maybe uh, parts of a, um, of, of a loot? Are they external donations and therefore the subject of gratitude and obligations? Or are they kept just in case because we don't know that maybe one day they will be important? So our colleague Namana Huja spoke about the many reasons why certain kinds of museum objects are uh, destined from the beginning to be storage object rather than display object. Some are too large, some, too, some are too small to display, so they would be difficult to see. Some are aesthetically unremarkable or incomprehensible, others are also too fragmentary. Some are too precious to put on display. <coughs> and to be honest, uh, some are also simply too boring. So finally, some are also too sensitive to show to audiences. So some paintings that illustrate a famous uh, sacred love song are too direct for public displays. Or paintings that show the Prophet Muhammad's face do exist obviously in the tradition, but in today's climate showing them might be considered as provocative. And then there are also objects in the museum that derive from an, eth an ethically troubling chapter in the history of collecting one that is no longer practiced, but whose residues still remain to be dealt with. So my colleague, Christina Ricks, um, who once worked at the Egyptian section of the Manchester Museum, she recalls opening a drawer in a storage area and discovering packages of um, mummy lung tissues and fingernails. So while other parts of the museum uh, world were addressing the ethical uh, dilemmas of holding human remains, in particular in places like Australia and in many ethnological collections, uh, Christina Riggs found that these concerns did not, interestingly, they did not seem to apply to Egyptian mummies or other human remains from the ancient past. So mummy autopsies continued within the museum even as other kinds of human remains were returned to communities for burial. So she threw up very sharp questions about the present day functions, the practices, and the meanings of museums that are the legacies of colonialism. And she also rightly challenged the discourse and the operations for which a mummy is turned into an object suitable for scientific investigation, rather than being seen as the remains of a human being. 
and asked uh, questions about the meaning and unquestioned authority of science and the West's need for cognitive and intellectual control over the heritage of Egypt. I now, I've been to Turin where there's a large collection of um, Egyptian art is held in, <clears throat> in the Museo Egizio and um, it was remarkable to see that at least now they put up a little sign of warning to say that the next room contains human remains and that people should um, kind of, if they should respect that and also be aware of it uh, or maybe not enter it if they don't feel like it. And so I think there's a new development going on, but it's a, it's a new development. <clears throat> Then finally, um, my own research um, took me to the study rooms of museums. It is here where knowledge is also created, though not necessarily by average visitors, but by specialists who wish to consult a particular items to study them. So here they could and can usually be retrieved through inventories and the help of archivists or curators. A good example are cuneiform tablets. So objects that are studied by specialists um, in the scholarly backstage area of the museum, but not all of them are visually ar um, arresting enough or not uh, legible for the general audience, which is why most of them are kept in storage. And from Mesopotamia, from the same area, there are also objects that are leftovers, um, for example, from the reconstructed Ishtar Gate in the Pergamon Museum that you see on the top picture. So what now looks like this um, actually started off like this, and that's the photograph and the button. <clears throat> so it took uh, around 30 years to reconstruct uh, this gate. As those of you who have been to Berlin um, might have assumed that they all also original uh, tiles and maybe this is the complete gate, which is kind of the message that the museum also conveys. Um, this picture is also on display, but um, it's very small and it kind of is used um, to uh, convey a kind of triumphalist story behind the reconstruction of this gate um, to show what or hard labor it actually is. But I went to the archive and I tried to kind of reconstruct the, uh, the reconstruction of the gate. Um, and I came to the conclusion that it's really a very, it was a very artificial undertaking that tells us a lot more about the museum space where these bricks entered uh, than about Babylon where they were excavated. So they were excavated in 1899. It took around uh, 30 years for the, for the gate to actually be resembled. And so this picture actually is only a small bit of a, a long biography of these uh, objects that moved from attic uh, to store um, and had very provisional homes until it was finally decided that this is how the reconstructed air gate uh, should look like because the place was actually far too small to uh, resemble the entire gate, and also many of the fragments were missing. So the audience was mainly interested in these animal figures that you can see, but then you, they wouldn't always find matching parts of it. Um, so what happened was that they actually went out to a workshop um, just outside Berlin and had many of them remade. So you actually see a lot of fake uh, tiles and bricks in this reconstruction. Also, um, because not all the bricks, tiles, and fragments fit into the limited space, um, many then ended up in storage. So some of them in new facilities, as you can see on the right, on the bottom right, but some of them also at the edges of town um, and these boxes that I think are really fascinating. Um, so <clears throat> after years, um, um, of, of you know, storing these objects now almost a hundred years. Um, meanwhile, there was actually an attempt to reconstruct the gate in Babylon in Iraq itself, um, notably with fake tiles again, with the original tiles um, ironically stored, safely stored in Berlin on site, and we could, should discuss why, why these kind of situations happen. <coughs> 
And finally, um, we also need to address a last type of storage um, that is presented as a solution for storage problems that will, but, but which will pose problems of its own. And that is, of course, digital storage. So today, many museums invest in open digital databases. To take only one example, uh, the British Museum's online database makes some 3.5 million of its 8 million objects digitally available to the public, as uh, Ruth Horry gave insight during our workshop. But what are the implications of having so much virtual information available? So would scholars then still need to handle the objects themselves? Uh, those of you who are academics or researchers, um, you would fly to Europe to see an object of, of your interest and you were told um, at the spot, oh, we're not pulling this out of the store because it's online. <laughs> so uh, it actually happens a lot um, and the implication is that it's no longer necessary to get funds to travel and see objects themselves. Um, so if they wish to do so, would the British Museum actually invest in the expense of making the actual objects available? That is the question. And when it, ha when it actually has, um, from its point of view, fulfilled its obligation to public service by making so much of the store visible to all. So does the presence of the digital copy contribute perhaps also to the inaccess inaccessib uh, inaccessibility of actual objects? And as these museums expand their digital uh, collections, uh, working with the virtual objects becomes easier and less expensive even for the museum itself uh, that might want to use images of the objects in virtual exhibitions, on websites, or even in the galleries. So perhaps digital objects might be substitutes uh, in the future for real ones. So digital storage raises very difficult questions relating to the benefits of keeping expensive museums if virtual archives are in place. And indeed, the virtual double often seems to have greater scholarly usefulness than the original, at least for some of us, because it allows for microscopic examination, comparison also across time and space, decontextualization, also virtual collages and digital montage. But useful as it is, it also raises questions in respect to the mobility and the dispersal of museum objects through the digital. So how does it affect the ways things are understood? But digitization of museum collections does not necessarily make the objects more democratic. The museums with the greatest funds for digitization and elaborate websites populate the digital domain with their objects. So their objects will also continue to do dominate the canon. And furthermore, and, and you know, many of you who write books, they know you, one tends to publish what is uh, um, accessible and available. And furthermore, reproductions do not necessarily move objects within reach of an audience or a scholar. Because with fees being high, uh, digitization can perhaps be described as a new economic power in museology altogether. So we assume that uh, digital storage provides an alternative form of access to objects, one that is democratic and stable. We even change the way we treat and keep real objects that recede in importance in the face of the digital copy. But at the same time, we all know that the digital is not forever. It is vulnerable, it ages, it can be corrupted and lost, it can be hacked, it can be forged. And the overdependence that we have on it today might be something that one day we regret. So let me conclude. A history of storage is a history of things that are not shown, but also not written about. And our understanding of museums and the intellectual histories they encode undergoes um, a radical shift when we consider what a museum shows alongside the usually much larger range of things it stores. So when we opened this topic, we hoped to engage with the philosophy of storage, and we found ourselves engaging also with its poetics, its aesthetics, and its ethics as well. We saw that historically, 
the binary between backstage and front stage was not as sharply understood as it is today. We also saw that the backstage of museums had and still have much more to offer than the display spaces visible to the average museum visitor. So storage does not necessarily entail putting objects out of reach in locked away dusty boxes. Many museums have always consisted of large libraries and study areas that are rarely visible to the museum visitor. But while many of these hidden items can be consulted by a selected audiences in these study areas, this may not apply to a larger proportion of collection items in the museum store. So perhaps instead of asking why these things are in storage, inaccessible and never visible to all of us, I thought maybe it's a more useful question to ask, uh, why should they be on display at all? So this, however, would entail also changing our understanding about museums and see them more as archives that store objects for the unforeseeable future. Here, objects can be retrieved when the time has come, so to speak, even if we don't know what this future will look like and where the objects will be stored in the future as collections keep growing. And specialists suggest that some of them might indeed end up underground, or perhaps, as it some, some archaeologists um, suggested, they may perhaps not even be dug out in the first place. Thank you very much. So uh, just for all of you to repeat, um, so the question was um, whether museums thought about repatriating objects that are in storage. It is definitely a theme that Kavita and I also s thought about a lot. Um, I don't think you can disconnect the two themes, storage and repatriation. So it's a very important question to address. I don't actually think that from a museum point of view, it actually matters when it comes to repatriation, whether the you know, the objects are in store or whether they are on display, because in general, they don't like to repatriate. Um, and I think it wouldn't be an argument for a museum to say, but you know, they're displaying it anyway, can you not return it? So we ask around and we try to get, you know, understand this kind of topic, and that's the kind of conclusion we came to. It doesn't actually make a difference from the side of the, um, of the owner. Obviously, for the other side, it does make a difference because it, it doesn't make sense at all. And we came, we came across several um, examples. I gave you one from my own research. Obviously, when it comes to war zones like Iraq, the argument would always be, but no, uh, they wouldn't be safe. <laughs> so we can't return them right now because, you know, you are at war, like a war that we caused. But anyway, that's not, that's not as far as the discussion goes. But um, um, also, Kavita uh, looked at when we presented the book in Delhi uh, last week, Kavita gave an example from, uh, from the Taj Mahal site and uh, Victoria, Vic the Victorian Albert Museum. And uh, so there are examples where even there, there are also arguments against repatriation. There are very good cases that can be made for repatriation because um, they are meaningful objects for the people of the country where the objects come from and the objects are in storage of the museum where they are held. But um, yeah, I don't think that this is how it works. <laughs> Can I take more questions? Is that okay? If I take a few, qu I don't know how much time we have for questions. Yeah, yeah, okay. Are there any? Are there any? Oh, sorry. Thank, thank you. Uh, are there any museums that you know of that are seriously de? Stocking the the deaccessioning, you mean? Yeah, I think it it happens, and it's just not talked about. So that's why I started with the, the Detroit case. It's an interesting case because it was made public. Um, there's another case where it, the accessioning was made public. Um, the UCLA uh, UC, uh, University College London. 
um, museum collections needed to accession some of its collection because it had no space again. And so they made a visitor survey. <laughs> and so people were visiting the museum and they were giving a questionnaire to ask people what they felt uh, should be accept uh, deaccessioned. So yes, it definitely happens, but I think most institutions are not brave enough to uh, address the topic, and that goes back also to, re to the repatriation argument. Um, for example, in Berlin, they're currently building a new museum called the Humboldt Forum, where some ethnological and also Asian collections will be housed in the center of Berlin. There wasn't, uh, it wasn't a very healthy discussion in the sense that things like, uh, discussions like repatriation and also uh, what kind of display we want um, wasn't really carried out in a kind of balanced way. And there was a lot of criticism. And one of the curators interestingly actually said, I think if the visitors knew, if we took them to the storage area and they actually knew how much stuff there is just lying around, there would also be more public sort of support for that critical debate that we need to have. Why is it here in the first place? And so she was hinting at um, the colonial history of many European nations that um, through that theme again of storage and the vast amount of things that people would encounter that don't even know that it's there in the first place, that could be triggered just through the, the vast amount of stuff lying around. Um, and so, again, it kind of bubbles up, but um, yeah, it's not, a very, it's not a very public debate. I think it's done a lot, actually, but we wouldn't necessarily find out. <laughs> yes. I think another example was the Northampton Shoe Museum that it was quite public, the deaccessioning of an object, and then uh, it was quite a scandal because the community got together and wanted it back, and they didn't want the music to, museum to sell. But my question really is uh, about contemporary collecting across the world, especially in the UK and the US, and how, what pressure does that put on hierarchies of display and therefore in storage? You mean in terms of, can I just ask back, uh, in terms of taste or canon or? Uh, in terms of canon. Yeah. Canon. Yeah. I think, to be honest, it really, it, most of it depends on people on, and individual decisions that people take. So uh, what we encountered talking to many colleagues in the museum is that there are types of objects that one curator would consider as very valuable and important and another um, wouldn't because maybe their speciality is in something different, their approach might be different, they might think um, of display as something that should work in a particular way, they might have a prefigured idea about the audience, there might be different audiences, also different objects that work for different audiences. So if you take a place like Birmingham in the UK, it's a very vibrant multicultural city and so a lot is happening there in terms of decolonizing the museum. So I think in the course of this, uh, these kind of movements, uh, stuff might be taken out of the store that might be of interest for that particular audience at that particular time, but then it might move away again. But in terms of collecting, I guess it's the same thing. You acquire what is of interest at that particular time, but that really changes depending on who as an individual is in charge. But you do create space in the museum gallery, right? Which means objects then go into storage and then therefore there's more pressure in a storage that's already full. Is that something you've seen as well? Because contemporary collecting, let's say, of the women's movement in the US brought in new objects. Mm -hmm. So what does that do to the politics mean. of then storage and display? You would probably have to prioritize if you acquire something new. I mean, what the, the process you describe, it's a process. You don't acquire something and then you realize immediately, oh, there's actually no space for it. Um, so I, th I think it's a, it's a process that lasts a few decades. And then you come to a point where you actually realize all of a sudden that you're running out of space. It's no longer safe to keep the objects perhaps in that kind of cramped space. And then uh, that then only triggers a whole debate about what's important and what not. But it really goes um, into the core of 
you know, what will matter also for the future, not only now, but what will matter for future generations. I mean, it's a bit, I think a good comparison is perhaps spring cleaning, for those of you who do it. Um, it's, one kind of goes into, uh, through a very personal process, you ask yourself questions, do I keep what matters to me? Do I keep what mattered to my grandmother? Or should I actually keep what might be of interest for my own grandchildren? And so it's, so it's very complex because you first have to kind of decide what actually, what the criterion for, for value actually is. Um, having said that, I don't actually think that process is that philosophical. I think often it's simply pragmatic. It might be related to size and if something's kind of falling apart, maybe it's easier to get rid of it. Um, yes. Um. Thank you, Miriam. That was, that was quite revealing. And I was thinking as you were speaking that the attitude towards storage or how it's sort of historically developed is now actually going to permanent displays as well because now increasingly museums concentrate on temporary exhibitions um, and things that are on permanent display in museums get less and less attention. Um, and in a very strange way, they are also becoming <laughs> a storage that's not really looked at because both you know, financial resources, uh, other human resources are now more and more directed to temporary exhibitions. So <laughs> that's also another area that probably needs like a similar understanding. I, I just said to Kavita and Deli, we, we already up for volume two of the book <laughs> <laughs> because there has been also so much input from our audiences and interesting comments and we didn't really address the repatriation uh, theme properly enough. And that again, yeah, let me take this as a comment if, if that's okay for you, is a very important point because um, at least um, in Europe there is a rise of the visit visitor numbers a rise for temporary exhibitions, but they are terrible for the permanent displays. Um, and people start writing books about that in, in museum studies. And so it's a very good point to actually consider this as a kind of semi, back, almost backstage area. So there are a lot of liminal spaces anyway. That's why we wanted to move away from the binary of display and storage. Um, the study rooms are not a kind of liminal space. So thanks for that comment. Good evening. Uh, when we are talking about an object being deaccessioned from a museum, from your surveys and from the people you have talked to, from the institutions that you have visited, what have you seen? Once they deaccession the objects, do they destroy them? Or do they give them away to other collections? So again, um, we couldn't really, I mean, it was an ethnograph of official ethnographic research, I sh should point out. I mean, there are museum ethnographers, uh, anthropologists who do that kind of work, not with, the, not with storage. What Kavita and I tried was that we informally talked to people. And um, as I try to convey, it wasn't necessarily easy. People don't like talking about it. And it's understandable. I worked in a museum. You are, you are the public face of an institution. And uh, you could say certain things off the record, um, as I'm sure many of you would do if you trust the person. But if you give an official tour, if you know there are two academics uh, uh, doing a book on museum storage, you, I would be very careful <laughs> about what I actually say about these things. So uh, unfortunately, we didn't find out as much as we wanted to. Um, I can say uh, what I said earlier, I think it happens a lot. Destruction, again, that is one step even further. So it's hard enough to talk about deaccessioning for people, but talking about destroying objects we haven't come across anyone who would admit that this is happening. Though I could well imagine that it, this happens as well. Yes. <laughs> I heard a yes in the audience, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, uh, would uh, museums keep inventory lists of all that they have so, which can be shared with other museums? So some museums which are lacking something can trade in with other museums like that. It could be a barter system or 
within a purchase system amongst museums? Yes, um, this is also a very important point. Um, I mean, historically, this has been the case for a long time that the museums swapped objects, they make replica of sculptures to kind of get a, a complete collection. Um, it's, uh, it's an impossible task, but the attempt has been there. So yes, I heard of swapping also, that, that happens. Um, I think that's probably s safer also to say for curator than actually admitting that something has been deaccessioned. So yes, we heard of examples of swapping, definitely. It's interesting, isn't it? So I, I'm not sure if everyone heard. Um, so the comment was that um, a Chinese vase was um, sold in Cleveland in order to acquire contemporary Chinese art. Um, I think that's th these things, they are interesting case studies because f from a point of view um, today, it has seen you know, as we don't need as many Chinese vases. Do you need just one or do you need, do you need many of them? Um, for a specialist, the specialist will say, of course we need many, because they're all different. You know, the tiny little differences. So how can you even question that we don't need that many to com be able to compare them with one another? And there's such a great variety. And the same might be then said about the contemporary Chinese art in maybe a hundred times. You know, someone might walk in and say, oh, they all look the same. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's the big question. Do you need just one, a sample, or do you need many? I mean, there are folk museums where you have, you know, um, just pots or just or telephones. Do you need, I mean, old telephones from, I don't know, from the 1950s? Um, uh, do you need just one sample or do you need all kind of brands? Mobile phones, take mobile phones from today. Do we just keep one for the future or do we keep 50? Do we keep, keep all brands that are available? And that really, it's also an interesting question and it depends on what you want and what, who's going to see this, who's going to study it. Yes, I think that's a, it's a big, there's a big, yes, there's a, yeah, you don't, yes, I mean, Institutions like the British Museum, that's where they tr want to go. Because as you say, it's not, it doesn't question ownership. I think many are, are happy to share. Uh, they also call many of the things shared heritage. Um, but I mean, there's certain things, there's certain problems. Um, if, if a country wants something back, they want it back, they don't want it to have it just on loan. But then secondly, you could repatriate as many objects as you want. It still doesn't mean that the museum is decolonized. That is a different project. And I think a worry that many museum critiques have is that once something is repatriated, it might be considered as a solved case by many museums, which means you don't have to explain your audience where the object comes from. They're no longer, it's, it's kind of a, it's almost like a, um, abolition for a museum. Um, there's no longer a need to justify its existence. And so in many ways, the cases that haven't been solved, at least they trigger a public debate. And it shows the museum as a space where the objects didn't kind of mis uh, mysteriously just arrive, but it's still, that way they they are still a complex place where we constantly question how did it happen, why did it happen, why is the stuff there, why are so many of the things there. So yeah, it kind of keeps it alive. So it's a case to case scenario obviously, but um, decolonizing the museum, it's a different thing from repatriation. Um, thank you, I wanted to ask, I was interested in your comment um, that 
temporary exhibitions are detrimental to the permanent collections. Um, I, just, I just wondered why, because it seems to me that the, sometimes the temporary exhibitions bring in um, a big audience. I'm thinking of the recent Ashurbanipal um, exhibition in the British Museum. And um, I would have thought that people who came to that might well then revisit the museum, walk through other parts mm. of it, buy things, you know, and generally um, contribute to the, to the life of the museum. So is it a question of space or wh what's the reason why you think they're not a good thing? I think many of them might actually do it. I think the, the good exhibitions that draw many people in, hopefully it will make them explore other museum collections as well. I think in this particular case, because that exhibition um, was uh, in the British Museum uh, about King Ashurbanipal, it was such an aesthetically appealing, very pleasing exhibition. I mean, the lighting was amazing, and I've never seen the slabs come to life in such a way because they, they used audio tools and these visual tools. And I mean, then going back to the permanent display <laughs> was almost you know, it's kind of a disappointment, you know, that, and I think that particular case, it might be particularly difficult. And my first thought was, oh, could they only always display the slabs that way, but it would be expensive. And as, as many of you know, make changing a permanent display, it's a vast, it's an incredible undertaking. You need a lot of money and resources. There's a lot of discussion going on. Not everyone wants the same thing. And I've been told even changing a small label can trigger uh, you know, debates and fights between people. So um, they are actually in the British Museum, they are restructuring. For those of you who don't know, there will be a new display on Egyptian art. But even that has already, uh, like already now, people are criticizing it, even though it hasn't actually happened. So in a way, I suppose that contemporary exhibitions are also easier because you know they're not permanent, so you don't have to. You can sort of take them in and then let go again. You don't have to actually keep them with you, but also because many of them address debates and things that are that matter to people at the moment. But ideally, a museum. I mean, I can say many things because I don't work in a museum. <laughs> ideally, um, a museum would find ways to make objects relevant beyond the pure practice of displaying it. I mean, there are other means. There are museum pedagogies, there are tours, there are many things one can do, and obviously this is what many museums are already doing. Um, so I think the question of relevance could also, it, it would work for permanent displays as well, maybe. Any more questions? or comments as well, and I'd love to take more comments also. In this particular case, no. There, it was just the glass um, where you allowed to pass a workshop and see what's going on backstage. I mean, I talked to someone who actually worked in this space. It's not easy <laughs> to work in that space. So it might be, you know, it, <laughs> it's a gain for the, o for the audience, but not necessarily for the experts who have to use it use that space to work. I think, <laughs> as you can see, no, but I mean, there are handling sessions in many museums now, especially for children. So I've seen a lot of that, which I think is, again, it goes back to the Sloan example that I, I brought, that I explained at the beginning. So I think, again, that's an interesting development that the museum is no longer about vision, but it's also, again, about the tactile and smell. And so definitely, I think many museums have understood that people take more in, the more senses they can use. So there's a lot happening in that respect. Um, 
So just uh, just wanted to follow up on you know the question Anupam asked earlier uh, about you know what happens to the objects if they are not destroyed or like what actually happens after you've made that decision. Well, again, I wouldn't know because it, it's it really is a case to case scenario. I think it does happen and and. I wouldn't know any details about what actually happens to so these objects. So aren't a lot of museums either, you know, in some way uh, required to sort of divulge because they're either part of non-profits or associated with some government agencies. Yes, there are a few private ones as well, but aren't they like required to keep track of what they have and then value it and then if they dispose it, you know, how are they doing that? Isn't that like a reposi repository of that kind of information? I mean, that officially, I think, yes. I think museums are considered safe spaces where objects are preserved um, for the long durée. I think, first of all, many objects are not actually on the register. There are objects that are not catalogued, vast amounts. I know this because I worked in a museum institution and I was cataloging things that weren't cataloged for a long time. They were there. And there were also many things that were not cataloged that probably will, are still not cataloged and they will not be cataloged. Because maybe the institution thinks it's not priority, nobody might ask for it anyway. So yeah, there is the stuff lying around that the Detroit uh, visitor talked about that definitely exists. And so, um, are they allowed to do it? I think in the case of Detroit, I think obviously it is possible as long as there is a debate about it and a city is involved or whoever owns the museum, whoever funds the museum, obviously it's not an easy process and nobody can just take, no institution can just make that decision unless it's a private institution. But uh, an institution like the Detroit Art Museum there was a lot of discussion, and the same with UCL. It was, there was a public debate about it. And I think if you make it transparent, it's also more accepted, even though it might be a difficult process. That means even if they sell it, you don't really know who they're selling it to, was there price discovery, were there, I don't know, like uh, incentives that move people one way or another? Well, when I said things are taboo, I really mean it. <laughs> That they, we tried to find out many things and we didn't. And that in itself is, that is an argument in itself. The, the backstage tour that we received at the v &A, it was very curated. Um, and th there were curators in the team who kind of tried to say things like, come on, tell us the truth, we all know what it's like. And it didn't, it didn't work. And, and so we need to think about why this is, that there are certain things that people don't like to talk about. So that in itself, then for us, we concluded is an interesting information. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Miriam. It was really exciting. It, it, it took me on a journey in 1989 well, when I was in the British Museum. By mistake, I opened a door, one door, because I used to be there every day, and I entered into a morgue which had many mummies, more than 100. And uh, I was very scared because uh, I really felt like I was in a, you can say, uh, in a morgue, of course, there were 100 mummies as long as a very big corridor. And I ran from one end to the other, just took photographs at random, but I was scared. And then it brought me back when I, when I shared this experience with the director, he said, good, you experienced it. But uh, the thing is that, what do you do with all these things? It is a tough job, maintaining all these things in storage, conservation of all these things. Okay, you can't handle everything, you require a special lab for all these things. Exchanging all these, you can say, articles with different museums, 
perhaps what the government can do is set up different museums in different villages towns where you can have these you can say uh, things shown to the public when people can't travel to you can say those kind of museums the museum travels to them and they can share i can really imagine that we just got nespereno over here but how many mummies have a lot of history and they're stored in the british museum so that was an idea and she's brought up many things exchanging articles are they really worth it really okay are we going to maintain it? all those questions come can we lend them can we give them as a gift so she has raised a lot of questions the basic thing is how can we do research on all these things which are in our storage so thank you miriam for raising all these questions this is the most important section of museology that how do you look after the storage which has two third of the collection of the entire museum in it because you require space in the country space in the museum space in the city like mumbai over here in the csmbs has it even xavier's has it you have an open storage also but that is not enough so i once again thank miriam for coming over here i thank our sponsor mr mudit jain please do that again and again and again and uh, i i would like to invite you all for tomorrow's lecture on, by purnima sankrishna on ganga panels so hope to see you all tomorrow till then good night